I'm Gary Schneeberger, co-host of Beyond the Crucible. I'm popping in before Warwick for just a few seconds to tell you that this week, like last week, as our team takes time to celebrate the holidays with our families, we're running encore episodes of the best shows of 2023. This week, we're shining the spotlight again on the story of Janine Shepard, who has come to characterize her crucible like this. I was an athlete at the top of her game. I was on my way to the Olympics, representing my beautiful home of Australia, when it all went black. Welcome, everyone, to Beyond the Crucible, the podcast that dares to talk about setback and failure, but not so we can commiserate, so we can elevate. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show, and our mission today is to offer you the hope that your crucible experiences, those tragedies and challenges you faced or are facing at this moment, don't define you. They refine you. They did not happen to you. They happened for you. And I don't really know anybody who knows this better than the founder of Beyond the Crucible, the host of the show, and my friend, Warwick Fairfax. Warwick, we are, um, once again, I, I, I haven't done the actual math, so I don't know for sure, but I think this is the 4,802nd <laughs> guest we've had who's also from Australia. So um, we have a good one today, for sure. Absolutely. Very much looking forward to it. And the good one today, listener, is uh, Janine Shepard. She has more than just a great story, and you'll hear that here. Through her years of struggle, she fought to learn as much as possible about the human mind, body, and spirit through education and research. She's worked around the globe as a coach and as a speaker for major corporations on hundreds of custom keynotes and leadership development programs. Clients consistently rate her as the, quote, best ever, unquote, speaker, and she invariably receives standing ovations. The story of her journey from gifted athlete to paraplegic and her remarkable recovery, if I can't walk, then maybe I can fly, stay tuned, she'll explain that, engages Janine's audiences profoundly. Relating her true life struggles gains listener respect and compassion, and Janine goes on to pass along her insights from this extraordinary journey to captivated listeners. Janine takes her audiences on a roller coaster ride of emotional funding and inspirational tales. You'll hear them here. Uh, many of her uh, from her own life, as well as borrowing from her intensive studies. Janine's TEDx talk is so compelling that TED.com made it the talk of the day. That's a big thing, folks. Um, and it's been viewed by millions worldwide. Audiences rate her presentations as so engaging that they hardly notice the passage of her too short time on stage. Janine's work is science-based and proven, adding validation to her credibility as an educator and speaker. She's an ambassador for Spinal Cure Australia and Red Bull Wings for Life and is committed to helping find a cure for spinal cord injury in the near future. She was awarded the Order of Australia, the nation's highest honor. She's a contributor to Deepak Chopra's workshops and has been featured on 60 Minutes and This Is Your Life. And I told you before we got going here, Janine, I just want to say this. It was so fun to put together your bio because I could not find one <laughs> comprehensive bio. I love that. I love the fact that you don't have like this one boilerplate bio. You have so many different areas of, of expertise, different levers to push and pull on as you do that. Uh, this is going to be, Warwick, a very, very robust conversation. And I'll turn it over to you right now. Well, Janine, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Just reviewing some of your material and your story. It's its just amazing. And I'm really looking forward to just your perspective because I felt like we haven't even spoken yet. And I feel like I'm learning a lot already. <laughs> so, And I've got, I'm sure, a lot more to learn. But I love the title of uh, a book you wrote, Defiant, A Broken Body Is Not a Broken Person. My gosh, I love, love that title. That is just amazing. So Obviously, there is the key crucible moment, but I'd love to just hear a bit about a young Janine growing up, sort of hope streams, maybe some of the threads maybe went a different direction, but maybe some of the threads went in the direction you're going now, though maybe you didn't realize it as a young Janine. But tell us, what was life like for Janine growing up? 
Well, that's a great question. I don't often get asked about those early years. Um, And thank you also, Gary, for that wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. So I always, well, I was an athlete. You know, my whole life revolved around sport. I always thought I was going to the Olympics. Um, And, you know, I'd gone from track and field, um, you know, athletics, all sorts of sports. I played, you know, many, many sports and then found myself in the unlikely sport for an Australian of cross-country skiing. And, uh, you know, people go, oh, is there snow in Australia? (laughs) And I go, yeah, there is. Um, And it's actually ideal for cross-country skiing. Oh. And cross-country skiing was a marriage of, you know, I my whole background of endurance sports, you know, triathlon, marathon, things like that, and just, you know, grit. You know, we cross-country skiing is looked upon as being probably the toughest aerobic sport in the world. So when I found myself in cross-country skiing um, sort of later in life, when I was at um, really starting uni and and picked it up so quickly and thought, this is my sport, this is the one. And I sort of climbed the ranks really quickly, became a member of the Australian ski team, had my sights set on the Olympics, was invited by the Canadian ski team coach to join up with their team in preparation for the Olympics. I was on top of the world. I felt like this is my destiny. Everything I've worked towards is getting me to these, you know, to the 88 uh, Winter Olympics in Calgary. So that's where I found myself, you know, my whole life sort of building up to the the Olympics, my background in sport, my background in endurance sports. And, yeah, I mean, my nickname was Janine the Machine, and I'll tell you a funny story about that later. <laughs> because, you know, I, I trained hard. I always trained with the guys. I just, yeah, I was I was a machine. So where did some of that adventurous machine-like qualities come from? I mean, from your parents, grandparents, friends. I mean, not everybody grows up with that, just the tenacity and whatever I do, I'm just going to go for it. You just sounded like you had that adventurous, you know, you some people are, are so afraid of risks and failing that they don't try and do anything. But that did not seem to be who you were. Where did that sense of machine-like adventurous <laughs> go for its spirit come from? Well, I think, you know, I've always pushed myself and my uh, early life was in Dural. Uh, you probably know where that is. Sure. It's sort yeah. of considered, you know, my my grandfather and um, came from, you know, they had a peach orchard. My grandfather actually was a POW. Um, I remember listening to a recording of his once talking about how we had a lot of similarities and he was a Japanese PO, prisoner of war, um, built the Burma Railway. I feel wow. like a lot of that you know, what my grandfather, that defiance and the stories that he had about um, wartime, um, I can sort of relate to a lot of that. And so I think, you know, my parents, you know, we lived a very sort of a frugal life. We they, they weren't in any way wealthy. We lived in Dural. We lived on property, um, you know, from a peach orchard. And I think a lot of that was just, you know, that, you know, you've got to really work hard. Uh, you got to just to get ahead. And I had that mentality. And I think I had, um, I, you know, I guess my gift was in sport and, and physical abilities. And so I just always thought that was how I defined myself. My body was my strength. And that was a really important um, part of my story because um, I, I lost the thing that I thought defined myself. So it was the perfect experience for me to lose that. Wow, that's an amazing. Well, let's push pause there. We'll have to come back to that because that's an incredible statement of what you just said. Yeah, talk about that day in uh, 1986. From what I understand, you were training in the Blue Mountains, which my parents had a cabin there in Blackie, so I'm pretty familiar with the Blue Mountains. It's a it's a beautiful mm-hmm. place. Uh, yeah. So. So talk about that. You you were training one day in the Blue Mountains, and you just tell us about that day. And yeah, so I we were on a bike ride uh, with my teammates. There were probably thirty of us. We did it a few times a year. We rode from Sydney up to the Blue Mountains, which is about a six hour ride, pretty grueling up mm-hmm. through the hills, which I loved. I always loved the hills. Trained on the hills. <laughs> it's my catchphrase. Love the hills. Um, and we'd been on our bikes for around five and a half hours, and I 
hadn't been well leading up to that day. In fact, it's funny, I always look back and think, oh, was I meant to go on that ride? I'd been at uni, I had been uh, overtraining, I hadn't been well, I'd had some blood tests and I probably shouldn't have gone, but I dragged myself out of bed and, you know, all my mates were going. So off we went and I was really tired. I remember just I was on that hill thinking, oh, you know, this is really hard work. And I just remember looking up, seeing the sun shining in my face, and then that's it. That's my last memory. And I was run over by a speeding truck. And, I mean, that's the moment that that's my crucible moment. That's the moment that changed my life. And um, I suffered extensive injuries. I actually have no memory of the accident. The doctor said I had post-traumatic amnesia. And the reason I don't remember is I left my body and I um, broke my neck and my back in six places, broke five ribs on my left side, my arm, my collarbone, bones of my feet, um, lost about five litres of blood. And, I mean, I shouldn't I shouldn't have survived. The speed that the truck was, the driver was going and uh, some people saw this something flying through the air, which was my body, and they stopped and ran back and, uh, the drive, a couple of guys in a utility truck had gotten out and they were about to lift me up and put me in a car. And this lady called Elizabeth, who's my soulmate, stopped them. And um, she just put got blankets or pieces of clothes and put them over me. And the ambulance was there very quickly. And had she not done that, I probably wouldn't, well, wouldn't have walked, wouldn't have survived. But she just sat with me. And um, that's an incredible story too. And I have since um, connected with the um, ambulance driver that picked me up as well. And he said, he said, she's not dying on my shift. And, and he got to the hospital and I only found this out fairly recently um, in the United Kingdom. And, of course, I turned up and this was, <laughs> he'd never seen anything like this. And um, Gary, the paramedic, had said, well, should we call the helicopter um, from Sydney? And he said, no, she's not going to make it. And so Gary went and pulled out his mate, who was a surgeon at the time, in theatre and said, please come and see this girl. And this doctor handed over, came out of theatre, came into emergency, looked at me and said, I'm taking over, you know stand aside to this young doctor um, who was out of his depth and just, you know, they called the helicopter up. They got blood flown up from Sydney. They flew me down to a specialist spinal unit and that's where I stayed for the next six months. But if it hadn't also been all of these, you know, these sort of moments that were aligning, you know, Gary pulling his mate out of theatre, coming to see me, all of these things. I mean, there were all these people that sort of intervened along the way and had it not been for them, I certainly wouldn't be here. I do remember, you know, leaving my body. I do remember having what I call, we like to say near-death experience. I say it was a death experience <laughs> because, you know, I had this sort of moment of choice, you know, do I go back to my body? Um, that body is broken. Uh, you know, it, it can't serve me anymore. And, um, and the really interesting thing about that, and people ask me about that all all the time people are asked sure, about, sure. you know, what's it like? What happened? What did you see? And I say, well, I didn't come back to teach people about that. Um, you know, I came back to teach people how to live in this life. Um, and I had to learn that too. <laughs> um, making a choice to come back to a paralyzed, broken body, as I said, was probably the thing that um, I needed to experience. And I needed it because, um, you know, loss is a great teacher and it, I always say it doesn't just show show us who who we are, it shows us who we're not. And mm. the lesson of that was I'm not my body. I remember opening my eyes and seeing my father's face and thinking, you know, just being utterly confused, you know, I was this wasn't this is not what I wanted. And I guess that's where the journey began, you know, began uh, the journey of disability of um I mean I really coming to terms with that loss and the grief. And even though I spent almost six months in hospital and that was paralysed, flat on my back, looking up at a, you know, through a mirror that was hanging above me, 
I actually, um, it was a very challenging situation, but it was also one of the most enriching experiences that I've ever had. And it taught me a lot about myself and about life and about other people and uh, really stripped me of any sense of entitlement. Wow. And I definitely want to want to go there. But, um, you know, obviously there, there, there initially must have been some anger, uh, frustration. Uh, I mean, one question that occurs to me, because one of the resilience checklists, you've got forgiveness. Obviously, one of the big ones up there, maybe number one is forgive that young guy in the truck that was driving too fast and was doing. Sometimes it's not people's fault. Sometimes it really is. And uh, it sure seemed like it was that person. So how do you, I'm, I'm assuming you must have given this checklist. How did you manage to forgive? Mm. I mean, there's acceptance of your situation, which is tough enough. But how did you manage to forgive that person? Yeah. That's a great question. And, um, you know, the, my re resilience checklist, which is, you know, t what I said, the 12 steps that I actually took to, to recover during, um, I'll just get to forgiveness in a sec. When I was in sure. hospital, I really didn't, I wasn't really angry. There was one particular time where I got very, very depressed when I thought, you know, I was counting down the weeks till I got out of bed and then the doctor's came and said, well, actually, no, we're going to start the clock again. You know, it's another two months, you know, and I just felt like giving up. And they did something that was very, um, very wise um, and clever, which is they moved me next to someone who was much more injured than I was. So they moved me next to a young girl called Maria. We were sim in sim similar in age. And she was a complete quadriplegic who'd been in the back of a car that had had an accident. And you know, I could never complain because, I mean, I looked at her and she was, you know, in a much worse situation than I was. And she was also an incredible human being. She was always smiling, always happy. And uh, she taught me a lot about what it means to accept. And we became great friends. So um, th that also came, you know, we talk about these interventions, things that have happened in my life just at the right time that have showed me and taught me a lesson. And so it wasn't really till I got home from hospital, almost six months later, that I really realised, wow, <laughs> this is this is pretty bad. <laughs> you know, I was in a wheelchair, plaster body cast. I'd lost so much weight. There was nothing left of me. I was attached to a catheter bottle. I had to learn to use a catheter. They basically told me, you know, you're a paraplegic and this is the rest of your life. And I got very depressed and I wanted to give up, you know, and I remember there was this moment um, where I was in my room, in my bed at night, and I just thought, no, I'm, I want to I want to get out of here. And I can remember pulling my, you know, crawling onto the floor in my room and sobbing. And I can remember calling out into the to the darkness. And, you know, I always I'm very careful with these words, um, God, universe, whatever it is that resonates with you but I remember my prayer was God just show me a way through this or show me a way out of this and that was this moment of it sort of almost brings me to tears now when I think of it but this moment of choice where I let go I knew that holding on to the life that I had was causing me to suffer and that my, it was like I had a clean slate now, and that was a gift, you know, because I'd always, my life revolved around sport and training, and that's who I was. And now it was like, okay, this is like a rebirth, a new beginning. And it wasn't until I got to that point, that letting go, that my life literally changed. And it was as if my eyes were open to a new way of seeing. And, of course, that's the moment when after that when I was outside and an aeroplane flew over and I looked up and thought, hmm, okay, <laughs> if I can't walk them, maybe I can fly. I mean, it was ridiculous, but, um, you know, that was the letting go. And part of that, and I'll tie that into forgiveness, mm -hmm. is um, realising that 
by holding on to my anger towards the driver, who was suffering? Well, I was suffering. Um, so I did some exercises. I wrote a forgiveness letter. I posted it to him, even though I didn't have his address. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that was really symbolic to, for me. And I always say you don't forgive to let someone off the hook. You forgive to let yourself off the hook. You know, and that's yeah, well, that's ahead. yeah, that's um, you know, one of the very practical things that I did to to let him um, let him off or let let us both off the hook, really. But you know, there was a hard one. That was the black belt forgiveness because oh, he yeah. was charged. He was charged with negligent driving, and he got an eighty dollar fine. Seriously, eighty dollars for yeah what he's put you through or anybody through eighty dollars for a six month body cast and permanent. Disability. I mean, that's just, yeah, doesn't seem like justice, but I guess the law is the law. But wow. And and you know, it's it's. I thank him now. I know his name, um, huh. and it's taught me a lot. I mean, I can't imagine a better way to learn about forgiveness than the person that ran you over um, <laughs> and changed your life forever. Which you know, now it's been a gift. It is a gift. It always has been, but. Um, I like to, to say to people, I talk about WTGIT, what's the gift in this? <laughs> and mm. there, there's always a gift. One of the things that you said to me when we first talked uh, comes to mind now, and that is you said, <clears throat> as you were just describing what you were describing, how difficult that was, how painful that was, how forgiveness was difficult, how you were in this facing this uncertain future, you said... Um, that uh, you realize in that moment that maybe rock bottom was a great place to start for figuring oh. out what your life was going to be, right? I mean, that was a turning point. And I want listeners to, to, to both hear what you said to me off air and then hear what you say now. Rock bottom can be a gift. Rock bottom can be the turning point. It can be go on the monopoly board of life. And that's what you experience, right? Yeah, absolutely. Rock bottom is the perfect place, the only place at times to start. And I think, you know, we can go through life and we have all these things that we, you know, the sort of scaffolding that we place around ourselves, the way that we define ourselves. Uh, this is, I'm, you know, we define ourselves through our jobs, through our relationships, through the things we own, our car, our house, you know. And when you lose all of those things, that's when the inner journey really starts. That's when you get to ask the really important questions. Well, who am I? What is my purpose in life? Um, and these are really important questions that we don't often get to the point where we ask those questions because we've got such busy lives, things around us that, you know, that we that we think, you know, form our identity. And so, as I say, said, you know, with with sport and my body, with this strong body, I really had to ask those questions to to dive deep and it was a gift because I realized you know my TED talk the original title was you're not your body it's now um, TED when they put it on their site changed it to a broken body isn't a broken person but um, when I was speaking with Mike Lundgren the curator of TEDx Kansas City and he said wow you know what an incredible story what's the most important thing you learned and I sort of thought hmm all right well uh I guess the most important question is, I'm not my body. And and that's important because, you know, we're not our jobs, we're not our relationships, we're not our home, we're not our car, we're not, we're not you know, anything that we think defines us. And when we build our identity on things, it's a very slippery slope. Well, I mean, there's so much wisdom in what you're saying. It's hard to know which which thread to pull on, but I'll try and pull <laughs> on as many as I can. Uh, and it's just uh, it's just amazing because, I mean, these are things that um, that come up uh, from time to time. It's just I'm both learning and but just some of the things you're saying, like about forgiveness. You forgive because you're kind of worth it. Um, one of the phrases we talk about is uh, lack of forgiveness is like drinking poison. It destroys you, you, you know. And so by forgiving, mm. you get out of prison, stop drinking poison, and it's exactly what you're saying. And 
Um, mm. You use the word choice, which is such a good word. You can't choose some of the consequences of what happened to you, but you can choose how you choose to react to that and reframe it, which is what mm. you've done, uh, you know, magnificently. Um, just you talk about blessing. Uh, I mean, I have a feeling you probably learned these things a lot quicker than I did because some of these concepts are more recent ones for me. And um, one of the things about my speaking is I, you know, I don't stand up and say, you know, life is great. You can do anything. My message is life is tough. Life is really tough. You know, life is filled with hills. And, you know, once you accept that, then the fact that it has hills doesn't matter anymore. You, you know, you can sort of roll up your sleeves and go, okay, well, this is this is what it's about. I have this awareness and now I know what it's all about. And yeah, we're all going through it. We all have our crucibles. We all have our challenges. We, um, you know, we've got to stay in our lane. It's it's comparison is a thief, thief of joy, you know, and that's one of the challenges that we have living in a an age of social media that we have. And um and, you know, talking about my TED Talk, uh, I'm a great fan of Joseph Campbell, you know, the great mythologist, you know, who um, mm. wrote about the hero's journey. So my TED Talk, which you'll see has five chairs on mm. stage, is actually created around uh, Joseph Campbell's um, hero's journey. And each chair, when I was planning my talk, um, each chair represented a challenge and or a struggle and an insight until the final insight, I'm not my body. So I've actually done workshops, uh, I call it my chair, the chair, five chair workshop, where I get people to actually think about, mm. um, you know, where they are now, which chair are they on? Are they on the chair of acceptance? Um, you know, and, and looking at whatever struggle they've got, because you see, life is about patterns. We're continually going through these challenges. The hills never stop. You get over one hill, oh, great. It's not like, okay, that's it. I've done it. It's like, okay, the next one's coming. <laughs> and once you see the pattern, then it becomes almost like a game. You know, you start to sort of go, yeah, I, I get this. I know where I am now. Okay. Um, what are the tools that I used? What are the tools in my toolkit? You know, what can I use? Which one will I pull out now? And so, you know, it's really fun to look at it like that, to look at, you know, everything as, um, you know, as I think, Gary, we talked about this, you know, things don't happen to us, they happen for us. Right. So, you know, what am, what can I learn from this? What tools have I developed? And, I mean, that's where my, um, my PhD is based on that at the moment, the resilience course that I wrote based on the steps that I took in my recovery. Um, and so I'm even sitting here looking at them now going, okay, now which one can I use now? <laughs> and, um, and and I also this morning, I, actually I was listening to um, your interview with my dear friend, Dr. Susie Green. Yeah, my, she's, yeah she's fabulous. Yeah. my In fact, the, I've got a picture behind us, you probably can't see it, which is <laughs> from Susie, a strengths chart. Um, so my uh, resilience course is based on positive psychology interventions. And uh, the last step on this course is gratitude. And um, I look back, when I was in hospital, gratitude wasn't even a thing. And now it's the most highly researched aspect of positive psychology. But I decided very early on that every single person that came in to visit me, I'd be grateful and I would thank them for coming in. <laughs> and what I didn't know was, you know, that we, what we know now is that gratitude changes our brains. And there's a lot of positive psychology interventions around gratitude. But that simple act of saying thank thank you and being grateful allowed me to lie in that hospital bed for almost six months. And it's my go-to tool even today. Every morning, what am I grateful for? You know. Uh, it's so important. I mean, one of the things I'm thinking of is <clears throat> your whole life you trained as an Olympic athlete, there was this determination. I love the phrase you used, Janine, the machine. As I'm thinking back, you know, none of that was lost. Well, the core of that was never lost, the physical part. But Janine, the machine, just moved in a different direction. Yeah, okay, I'm injured. Great. There's a big hill. I love hills. Let's power up the <laughs> hill, right? Okay, there's yeah, a yeah, challenge. Just, I, I can do hills. this. 
So I just feel like that inherent training wasn't lost. You know, you thought you were training for the Olympics. You were training for the Olympics. It was just a different Olympics. You know, not certainly one you not one you entered into, nor would anybody want to sign up up for. But does that make sense? That your determination, your training, the Janine machine mentality, you used every part of that to come back from your crucible and to get to a point that last year of gratitude. Does that kind of make sense? Oh, absolutely. And you know, along the you know, along the journey, I've learned so many lessons. I've, you know, I've I've dived into acceptance and commitment therapy. I've learned mindfulness training and meditation and and uh, and it's you know, it's and I've learned about letting go. I've learned about loosening my grip on the things that I think define me or my life. I mean, it's you know, every single day is a challenge when you have a disability. Every day you wake up and you get out of bed, it's like, okay, you know, um, I need to work on, I need to pull out these tools in my, my toolkit because it is challenging. And I, I do laugh that I have a friend that came around recently and said, you know what, I think, you know, you've moved on from Janine the Machine. <laughs> and, <laughs> really? <laughs> and, and, gave, and gave me a new nickname, which is hilarious, and calls me Janini Linguini. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> which, which I thought, yeah, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna embrace Janini, the, my inner Janini Linguini, you know, Linguini, <laughs> which is like flexible and uh -huh. you know, go, you know, sort of go, goes <laughs> with the flow, and so that's my new nickname now, Janini Linguini. <laughs> there you go. That I is suspect a good one. <laughs> I suspect that Warwick's going to get you up in the air here soon. <laughs> uh, before we get you uh, as a pilot. Um, Again, we do pre-interview calls with all guests just so we have the ability to ask informed questions. And I wrote, I have my notes from our pre-interview yeah. call right sure. here. And um, I wrote this question down when we first started talking um, to ask you, when you think back, you were, you were on the trajectory to go to the Olympics and now you're doing what you're doing now as a speaker, mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as an educator about resilience. And I asked you, you know, is there any way that you can compare it? Is this more gratifying? And here's what you said to me. Um, and I've, I'm going to read it right here to make sure that I got it right. Um, I was never going to the Olympics, you said. My life was always laid out like this. That, talking about, and we'll give you, listener, where you can find this resilience checklist, that show someone who's completed the 12 steps, who's not just completed them, but had to learn them, had to then teach them. That's a pretty bold statement to make. Uh, and obviously you stand by that statement that your life was never about the Olympics, right? Oh, it was, yeah, no, it wasn't. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a believer that we have a destiny, that we have a sacred contract in life and we need to get onto that path. And when we're on that path, um, we just know it. It's this intuitive internal knowing of this is what I'm meant to do. Um, and as hard as it's been, it's, you know, it's, these are the experiences that I needed to have. And I also believe that we're not given anything without also being given the strength Um to, to rise to the challenge. Incredible. I mean, I just want to dwell on that, uh, that thought that Gary mentioned. I was really struck by that when you said, I was never going to the Olympics. My life was always let out like this. I mean, that's reframing and acceptance at an incredible level. As I try to put that on in my life, saying, well, how, does, how would that apply to me? And there are probably listeners are thinking, Gee, what, what what would that mean for me? And the translation for me would be: uh, I was never going to be in a leading position to, you know, be in charge of John Fairfax Limited. Even though, in theory, in terms of shares and various other things, in theory, if I'd waited long enough, I probably would have been just objectively. But yet, reframing says there was always a greater purpose or, or different purpose, and mm. you know, being a person of faith. And from my theological uh, construct um, that God is sovereign and he has a sovereign will, and despite my stupidity and naivety, uh, if he wanted it to happen, it would have. But he, it was always the plan uh, for it not to happen doesn't, you know, uh, remove any of the stup stup stupid choices I made. But as I look back on it, I'm very grateful because you know, I've been married over 30 years to my wife as American. I have three adult kids. 
I love what I do at Beyond the Crucible. My kids are all uh, hardworking, humble, thriving people that would have been really tough for them growing up in a wealthy background in Sydney. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I look at my life and I feel uh, incredibly blessed. You know, it, the crucible, it's different crucible. Every once in a while, there's a little twinge and gosh, look what I did. And gosh, how stupid was I? And, but yeah, there's a sense of acceptance and blessing. And, but that notion, I never thought about it that way, saying I was never going to be in charge of John Fairfax Limited. That's with the application of your principle, if you will. That's a powerful principle that I think that can, that a lot of people can use thinking, you know, if you believe in destiny, uh, what happened was my destiny. How can I use this? What's the meaning mm. and what's the purpose? I mean, you and Susie, I'm sure, know a lot more about this than I do. But when you find meaning and purpose out of a crucible, that is mm. a path to some degree of psychological healing. And that's your every day of your <clears> life. <throat> that's what you do in your own life and for others. Try to help people see gratitude, meaning, and purpose in the crucible. Would that be like part of the center mm. of? how you get back from your worst day, if you will. Yeah, I th- you know, for me it's about, um, you know, that that whole idea of when you can't change what's happening on the outside, you're given the opportunity to change what's happening on the inside. You know, you have this sort of circle of influence. What can I influence? You know, what's in my control? Um, and I realised that for me, lying paralysed in a spinal ward, I couldn't change what was happening to my body, but I could change my reaction. I could simply decide to be thankful and grateful to everyone that came in to visit me. And the interesting thing about that is, you know, it actually is, as I said, you know, um, one of the most research aspects of positive psychology now that gratitude actually changes our brains, makes us more optimistic. We know that when we're optimistic, we're better problem solvers. We, you know, we have better perspective. um, We're happier, we're healthier, we flourish. So these are actually concrete things that we can do. Um, And deciding to reframe things is um, also a really important aspect of positive psychology, making the choice to say, okay, it didn't happen to me, it happened for me. Um, My belief that, you know, we do have a certain destiny and I've had enough sort of inner spiritual experiences to confirm that to me, um, that I am doing what I was meant to do was never about the Olympics. Uh, it was about, um, you know, learning to live fully and fearlessly in this life right now. And I, I think what you're saying is, you talked about identity, is that as wonderful as the Olympics are, it just felt like you realized there's a lot more to Janine Shepard than being an Olympic elite athlete, which is wonderful, but there's a lot more to you than just that. And I don't mean to demean that at all, but I don't know if that makes any degree of sense that, you know, who you are as a human, you have so many gifts and experience and, uh, you know, our identity shouldn't be in one thing. It's like, does it seem a bit constricting? Oh, who's Janine? Olympic athlete. Well, yeah, but there's a lot more to me than just that. Does that make sense? That I mean, what have you learned about identity in that whole Absolutely. And that's that's why so many elite athletes struggle when they give up their sport because they've, you know, attached themselves. That's who I am. And as long as you do that, you know, you never really get to ask the questions. You never really get to experience the essence of who we are, you know, spiritual beings having a human experience. Um, You never really get there. And so that's why loss has been a great teacher for me, particularly losing the thing that I thought defined who I was. Um, and I also, um, and there's a lot of research around this too, altruism and getting out of your own story. And I think for me, you know, speaking, writing, sharing my story gave me the opportunity to hear other people's stories. Um, one of my favourite things when I give a presentation is I'm usually there for hours talking to people afterwards as they share their story with me. And you know, very early on when I started speaking, I realised as people shared their stories, well, wow, I'm not alone, you know, I'm not the only one going through stuff. Um, so it really got me out of that my story, out of that why me into the why not me. I realised that um, we're all going through something and there's a great healing that happens from sharing our stories, hearing other people's stories um, and getting out of our own, our own, you know, smaller 
story into a larger human story. And I feel like, you know, there's sort of almost drops of grace as people, I'm sure many people have come up to you and said, Janine, I didn't go through what you went through. I had a different crucible, but what you shared helped me. It gave me hope. Now, you're not doing this to get the thank yous or the drops of grace, but it's an it's inevitable byproduct that says, okay, I'm seeing a bit more of some grand plan or some more purpose. I mean, does that make sense that when people say thank you, that mm. obviously that's a gift, but it, it doesn't make everything go away. Clearly, there are certain things that will never go away, but there's an element of, a bit of element of healing. Do you find that oh. when people just show their yeah. gratitude to you and you feel like yeah, what I you've... Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Absolutely. Yes, I was going to say yes to all of that. And I think that, um, you know, when someone comes up and says thank you to me, I say thank you to them because, you know, it's a circle. We're all giving and taking. And, you know, what I say is that I just carry a message when I'm on stage. I, I like to think that I'm holding up a mirror so that people can see their own lives. And I think that's the thing about, um, you know, my storytelling or sharing on stage which, you know, I tell a story, you know, I weave a lot of um, interventions into that that people can take away and use in their lives. But I think what I do is I get people to go, oh, yeah, and, and see a part of their life reflected in my story. And, you know, also, for example, looking at the chairs, where am I now? And, you know, and, and I guess there is that real sense of hope that comes from knowing that someone's been through something similar and they've survived so, um, yeah, I think that we're all helping each other. You know, there's that great sort of circle of influence that um, we're giving and taking and giving and taking, and that's what happens with storytelling. We are storytellers, all of us, from ancient times, you know, sitting around a fire and sharing our right. stories. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. That's how we get insight, um, and that's how we get healing. You know, as I'm looking at, some of the things in your resilience checklist, you've got the five principles, uh, you were never alone, the universe always says yes, you are the producer, director, and actor in the story of your life, choice is the most powerful tool you have, this too shall pass, and then the 12 steps at the back, there's so much wisdom. I mean, maybe this is an obvious question, but when you look back at what you went through, is it possible that Janine Shepard would have had a fraction of this wisdom with that that experience? I mean, it almost feels like you have Olympic level wisdom that came with an Olympic level crucible, if you will. <laughs> I mean, nobody wants to get wisdom that way, but it sure seems like. I mean, is there any way that you could have had the depth of wisdom that you have now? Uh, without what you went through? I mean, hope there's a way to answer that question without seeming too arrogant, but, you know, I do believe Absolutely. you have wisdom. Yeah. Let, let's just take it as written well, as the lawyers say. Let's enter into evidence that Janine Shepard has a lot of, <laughs> lot of wisdom. Let's just make that assumption, but you get the question. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. I think we all have it. We all have an innate wisdom. It's just tapping into it. And um, I think that's one of the, that's what I work on every day is, trying to understand the things in life that get in the way. You know, it's like a dirty window. You just have to clean that window sometimes to see outside. And I think that we have so much stuff around us that gets in the way of really understanding who we are at the deepest level. Um, and, you know, I guess, I mean, I'm a, I'm a long-term meditator. I, to me, meditating changes our lives because it gives us an opportunity to just quieten the mind and just to drop into something um, much, much deeper. And as long as we're scrolling on our phones and reading the news, <laughs> you know, it's just always about the outside. And, it, you know, to me, life is always about the inner journey. And, um, you know, ab if, had I not had my accident, um, well, as I said, I can't even go there because, I, so, Gary, I was always going to have my accident. That was my desk. That was my destiny in this life. and. Um, and it's a rich and meaningful life, and it is a blessing. And every single person that I've met along this way on this journey um, that has shared my story, one thing I'll take from this is that everybody has something. Everybody has Absolutely. some crucible. And I know that because, I mean, I've stood and I've listened 
to so many stories. And I just think that's what connects us all. So uh, I guess what I'm getting at is um, I'm not sure that you would have had the same level of wisdom that you do now without the accident. It's sort of like it was sort of a catalyst, a turbocharge. Maybe the wisdom was all, way, all there to be harnessed, but you still got to harness it. You still got to capture it, and bring it in. You're like fishing. You know, the fish are there, but you got to. I feel like mm. this that maybe one of the greatest gifts about what you went through is the level of wisdom you have. I mean, it's hard. Obviously, there's no way of knowing what the alternative path would have been. You would have maybe different kind of wisdom, but one of the key gifts from my frame of reference in a crucible is the opportunity to have tremendous wisdom, tremendous learning that comes out of it. Does that kind of make some degree of sense? Absolutely makes sense. And it's hard fought. I mean, you know, you don't you don't learn these things just by um without having to go through, you know, the dark night of the soul. And I've been through many of those. You know, I feel like, you know, my accident, which people know about, that was one thing. But, you know, I went through a marriage breakdown. I was a single mum for 10 years. I lost my home, you know, moved to another country with nothing behind me. I mean, I've had all these different sorts of challenges. And I think that's one thing about my story. And in, you know, my latest memoir, Defiant, you know, I, I write about those uh, different experiences. And in many ways, they were actually harder than my accident because it involved more than just me. You know, being a single mum to three kids, um, you know, that was probably one of the most challenging experiences of my life. Um, feeling that my marriage had broken down and that, I, you know, there was a sort of sense of guilt and failure around that. So all of these crucibles, these dark nights of the soul, um, you, you know, they nothing comes easily. And if it did, it wouldn't be worth having. You know, if everything was just, mm, okay, I've learned that, you know, they just it just wouldn't have that same, you know, the potent um, sort of sense of meaning that it has when you've really experienced it and appreciate it for what it is. Um, so um, all of those, you know, steps on the checklist, I look back on those and, you know, I can see where they came from and how I learned those things and how how I use them every day in my life. I feel like maybe the last word on, on this that occurs to me is coming back to that choice word. You made a choice, uh, you know, in the phrases we use, not to be defined by your worst day. You made a choice not to be defined by the crucible of the accident, of uh, divorce, and uh, being a single mom. Each one of those required choices. You made a choice. Not only would you not be defined by them, but you would seek to learn wisdom from them, seek to be grateful for them, and seek to see them as a gift. That all came with a choice. And after the choice came a lot of hard work. But that, to me, is the key Mm lesson point for listeners is we're in some sense of some of our choices. A choice to forgive, not necessarily condone. A choice to accept, a choice to see it as a gift. A choice to see that we're put on this earth for meaning and purpose to serve others or serve some greater good, whatever that means for you. I mean, we're, we're the, the sum of our choices. And, you know, you, that's kind of what you really teach is, you know, Make those choices. Take those twelve steps of acceptance, forgiveness, compassion, optimism, values, strengths, hope, meaning, humor, which I love, connection, mindfulness, gratitude, and so. I mean, you're really teaching people to make positive choices, to help use what they've been through to be grateful and to use it in service of others and a greater good. It's just really inspiring. So, thank you for what you do. It's um, it's incredibly uplifting. Well, I'm just I'm grateful to be given the opportunity. And, you know, it's funny when you talk about choice. I don't know if you know the spiritual teacher, um, Carolyn Mace, and she talks about choice being our greatest power because um, even great, whether you agree or not, even greater than love, she said, because you've got to choose to love. So mm. choice is very powerful. And, you know, for people out there that are struggling and feeling like they have no choice, um, that's all also okay because you know we've 
the world the last few years has been incredibly difficult and challenging. But even at my very lowest moments, I've always felt like I chose to come back to this body. That was a choice. That was the ultimate choice. So I'm going to make it count. You know, I'm going to find out why and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to create something of this life that, you know, as difficult and challenging as it's been, um, it was a choice. And interestingly, I think, you know, even though I remember clearly from my NDE, my near-death experience and the choice to come back, we've all made that choice to be in this body. Warwick, you made the choice to be in this body you're in now. Gary, you've made the choice to be in the body you've got now. So you just ask the question, okay, so now what? Yeah, and... What's great about that, you just built, uh, Janine, a, a runway for me to ask this question. And it's appropriate that it's a runway because where I'm a pilot. are you going to? There you go. <laughs> so, the part of the story that we've not gotten to, because this is so uh, both inspirational and, 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 and equipping, is while you were in that bed, while you were in recovery. Something happened. You saw something above you, and that changed the trajectory. One would say, could say, the flight path of your life. Talk about that a little bit. Well, it it did. That's when I decided, you know, in, in a wheelchair that if I couldn't walk, I'd fly. And um, you know, I was lifted up into an airplane, and everyone thought I was crazy. Well, shouldn't you be learning to walk? <laughs> um, and I went on, and I became a pilot. I got my private license, my commercial license, which was crazy because I'm actually paraplegic. I'm a walking paraplegic. Um, I became a flying instructor, an aerobatics flying instructor, commercial pilot. So um, it was sort of crazy and unlikely. And flying is a great metaphor for life. I mean, when, you know, my PhD title actually is if I can't walk, I'll fly. And it's sort of, you know, it's, it's obviously it's, it's um, physical, it's spiritual, it's metaphorical. It's, you know, for me, flight is the ultimate freedom. So it was perfect for me, um, because it's it's such a great you know spiritual metaphor about freedom, and uh, flying really gave me my life back. Taught me a lot about well, here I am. I'm a paraplegic, and I'm teaching people to fly upside down. You know, <laughs> it, it, I am not my body, um, and I learned a lot about flying. Um, there's a you know we one of the uh, formulas that we teach people in flying, one of the first formulas is attitude plus power equals performance. It's actually what flies an airplane um, from a 747 to a glider. It's a formula, mathematical formula that doesn't fail. So I talk a lot about that in my presentations. I talk about attitude, you know, because the attitude is the picture with the picture of the airplane in relationship to the horizon. And I talk about our attitude you know, what is our attitude to life? You know, our attitude is the, what I say, the story of me built on beliefs and opinions and judgments that we've collected throughout our lives that we, you know, we sort of, we don't realize how firmly we're stuck to that, those things, which are just things. It's not who we are, you know. So once we get to the point where we can sort of unpack that suitcase and and pull out those things and go, okay, well, is this, keeping me stuck? Is this helping or hindering me? And a lot of the time, you know, when we're really struggling in life, um, it, it, we, we go back to our early childhood and our training that has formed our attitude. And once we get to the point where we get to this sort of choiceless awareness where we can observe things and look at things and, and look at them in a very objective way and be curious and go, hmm, where did that come from? <laughs> then we can start to unpack it and create a new belief or a new mindset that serves us going forward into a much healthier sense of who we are. That sounds you heard, listener. You've heard me say it before, but not many times with a pilot and a pilot who flies upside down and teaches people how to fly upside down. That sounds you heard was the captain turning on the fasten seat belt sign, indicating that we're about to descend uh, the plane of this conversation, but we're not there yet. Before we do that, Janine, I have a couple things uh, I want to do um, with you. One, um, with who was the friend that gave you the new nickname? 
Oh, my friend Jim uh, gave uh, me the nickname Janini uh, Linguini. All right, with, with apologies to Jim, um, I thought of a new nickname as you were talking because uh, Janine the Machine was the old nickname. Based on what you've talked about, the help you offer people, the hope you offer people, I'm going to think of you as Janine the Canteen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> offering a cup of cold water, right, to people who need a sip after they slip. That's the way I'm going to think about uh, Janine Shepard from this moment on. That's um, cool. Everything rhymes. <laughs> that, there you go. That's that. That's the old writer in me. Um, before uh, we turn it back over to Warwick and the plane is on the ground, I would be remiss if I did not let you talk about where – listeners can find out more about you and the services you offer, and especially this resilience checklist that Warwick's been talking about. In fact, at that, at what you're going to uh, talk about at your website, there's also a resilience quiz that you can take for free, which I did. And I was happy to find out I'm a weeble uh, when I took oh, that good. quiz. <laughs> yes. So where can people find out more about Janine Shepard online? Well, well, I love I love being a weeble. My girlfriend told me weebles wobble, but they never fall down. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> so, uh, so good for being a weeble. Um, well, they can go to my website, JanineShepard.com. They can do the free uh, resilience test. Um, they can follow me on LinkedIn, on Instagram, Janine uh, underscore Shepard, I think it is on Instagram. Uh, Twitter, I, look, I don't do Twitter very much, to be honest. Um, but really, Instagram, LinkedIn, website, and I would say go and look at my TED Talk. Uh, just put in Janine Shepard TED, and uh, that'll give people a good, um, you know, idea of my story um, and what I do. And because my last name is Schneeberger, which no one can spell or pronounce, because Warwick has a name that has a silent W in the middle, how do they spell Shepard? Because there are a couple ways. So when they're doing the search, how do they spell your last name? That's a good question because um, – People always spell it incorrectly. So, right, that's why. Um, so Janine, J-A-N-I-N-E, and Shepard is S-H-E-P-H-E-R-D. And uh, Instagram is Janine under, underscore Shepard. LinkedIn, Janine Shepard. Twitter, Janine Shepard website. Um, and stay tuned. We've got lots of exciting things happening. Um, we are at the moment actually about to sign off. Uh, on a uh, screenplay for my latest book, Defiant. Um, we have a wonderful uh, female crew working on the screenplay, director, Claire McCarthy, who's um, one of the top female directors in the world. So uh, stay tuned for um, the movie of Defiant. All right. I'll Warwick, let you guys know. Warwick, take it away. Wow. Well, thank you, Janine. I really appreciate you being here. Um, kind of one question that we often end on is, but beyond the crucible, we have many listeners and there could be some out there who today might be their worst day. Maybe they're not, you know, maybe some terrible crucibles happened to them and um, they're not seeing much hope. As one recent podcast guest said, the bottom of the pit was so deep, he couldn't see the bottom. There was an endless bottom that could only get worse. No light, just Worse was his uh, attitude um, when he was at the bottom of, of the pit. So for those that maybe today may not be a great day, maybe their worst day, what's a word of hope you would offer somebody in that situation? Well, I know there's going to be a lot of people out there that are struggling right now. And um, what's really important is uh, to be compassionate with yourself. You know, when I have a bad day, I still have bad days. I always have a little go-to list of things that, um, you know, that I enjoy that, you know, are a part of practicing self-compassion, whether it's being out in nature, listening to music, having a hot bath, being with friends. Do those things. If you're having a bad day, do those things that nurture you, um, your sense of who you are. And, of course, my go-to exercise, which is gratitude. And we know that it does change our brains. We also know from neuroscience that it's not, you don't actually have to find anything. If you think, oh, there's nothing to be grateful for, just asking the question, what am I grateful for, starts the change. If you can do that for even every night or morning, get up in the morning and finish your day with what am I grateful for, 
and make it tangible. Think of the things like, well, today I called a friend and had a really good conversation. Um, uh, you know, I, I, there was some agency in that because I had to make that decision and that choice to pick up the phone, write this down, write these things down, keep track of it, journal, keep your journal for 21 days. And then just at the end of that time, really check in and say, well, how am I now? Um, you know, there's always something. I've all, I'm a firm belief that, you know, there's there are tools out there that we can use that can help us and give us hope even on our darkest days. I have been in the communications business long enough to know when the last word on the subject has been spoken, and it doesn't, of course, Janine Shepard's going to land the plane perfectly. She just did. Um, <laughs> so until the next time we're together, listeners, please remember this. You've heard it in this conversation. Oh, my goodness. We understand that your crucible experiences are tough. We understand how painful they are. But we also understand that if you learn the lessons of them, if you realize, as Janine talked about in a way that was revelatory to Warwick and me, if you, t if you think about them in a way that, that says, this is how your life was meant to be. These are the guardrails that were in place. This is, this is where your destiny was set. If you think about it that way, if you learn the lessons of the crucible, if you find, if you follow some of the things on Janine's uh, resilience checklist, it's not the worst day of your life. Your pit you can come out of and you can end up in the most rewarding spot in your life where Janine's ended up, where Warwick's ended up. And that is a life of significance. If you enjoyed this episode, learned something from it, we invite you to engage more deeply with those of us at Beyond the Crucible. Visit our website, beyondthecrucible.com, to explore a plethora of offerings to help you transform what's been broken into breakthrough. A great place to start? Our free online assessment, which will help you pinpoint where you are on your journey beyond your crucible and to chart a course forward. See you next week.